have in the chat or on the q and a i'll make sure to address them okay we're going to get started i just have to get my cursor in the right place okay fantastic so today we're talking about private school placement and planning and this is a series these are a series of webinars that we do in the company to educate parents about different processes and systems ideas ways that they can help their children so this is really one of those webinars um, I really enjoy, this is a little bit of a wordy one, but <laughs> I want to just make sure that you're understanding what you're getting into here, which is just that I'm going to really show you how you can understand the private school landscape. And I want to give you specific ways that you can use to approach your planning process. Our mission here at Evolved is to make sure that your child learns well. So we want to make sure that you as the parent are educated to pursue that mission as well for your own child. So I always like to give away perks and incentives and resources really for all of the families that we meet with and anyone who's live here today can email us after this is over. I'll give you the email at the end and you can have a copy of our book, which is 10 Steps to Admission Success. I really spent time this summer writing this down so that everyone who's coming into the company can learn about how to work through this process and what do we do at the beginning, middle, end of the process to help make sure that at this time, which is our notification time is happening right now, um, everyone can feel successful. So I'm just going to ask, this is only a half an hour, so just give me a few minutes. We're going to actually use some slides here to also direct you. And so in the first couple of minutes, I just like to give you an overview in a couple of different ways. So we're going to be covering different questions such as what characterizes a day school. A day school is, an, is a private school. There's going to be a couple of different terms we use in this word private. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about the general timeline for the admissions process and typical entry points as well as some ways to approach the private school process to ensure success and just some tips and then Q&A. So I hear from families all the time and I like just to spend a little time in my webinars connecting with my, my uh, attendees and really just making sure that uh, you know that if you're feeling any of these things about this process, it's really quite normal. And I understand that there's a sense of there's all of these different options. Sometimes clients will tell me they all look about the same. <laughs> I don't really understand what, you know, which school is sort of uh, for my child, which one has sort of the most competitiveness to it. How do you really get in? Are they telling me the truth? Is there you know, what's happening with, with this process. And there's uh, perhaps a sense of a little bit of like, you know, what you don't know in the process too. Um, so this is really where I come in. I'd like to introduce myself to you a little bit here. So for those of you who don't know me, I am a certified educator in New York City and New York State. I spent the earlier part of my career teaching in the classroom. I taught in the city public system and I taught in the private system and I really was able to understand from a teaching standpoint some of these, these experiences um, that, that I had. Um, I also worked uh, as a private learning specialist for many years. I still keep a small practice of that. I'm the parent of three children. Uh, we're exploring all kinds of options, been in the public system, private system, now boarding system, um, applicants. Uh, and I've worked as an education consultant for about 10 years now, uh, working with students all the way from twos programs all the way through high school programs. And I'm starting to add some college to that as well at this point. So it's definitely been a journey and I'm really enjoying the process of working with families, especially since this landscape is changing and really is becoming and always has become a little bit different year to year, but certainly with the pandemic, things are quite different. And we're gonna talk about some of those things as well. So in this webinar, these are our modules. So we're gonna talk again about characteristics of day schools, typical timelines, admissions processes, tips for you, Q and A, if you'd like to work with us, how you can work with us. And then of course, I'll tell you how to get your bonus. Sound good? Okay. So let's get into this first. So in terms of the characteristics of day schools, I really feel that you have so many wonderful options here in the New York City area. And we, we advise on schools in the area, but also private schools in New Jersey and Long Island and in the Westchester area. And 
we've been called upon to do a move to Florida. And so what I'll just say is that when it comes to private schools, the landscape here in this region is wonderfully, wonderfully diverse and wonderfully um, developed as well. So it is certainly a nice journey to go on, even just in an exploratory, an exploratory sense. Um, so I want to just clarify a couple of key terms that I want you to think about when you're shopping for a school. So the first is that when you think about your child, and maybe right now you're thinking about your very young child and you're thinking about coming into a, an independent or a private school at a twos program or at a kindergarten level, maybe you're coming in as a middle school student or a high school student. So each school is going to have a different level of what we call rigor. And some schools are going to also offer a more well-rounded experience. And I want to define what these words could mean so you can just go in with some insight to that. So when we talk about rigor, what we kind of mean is how much are the students asked to do and in how much time are they asked to do those things. So by this I mean if we ask a student at the age of six to be reading a certain level of book and to be seated in their seat for a certain amount of time, that may define the level of rigor that that student is working within. So some schools are going to require a very young student to have a high level of academic experience and capability and also to be doing a high level of seated academic work. And other programs may not emphasize that experience. Some middle school and high school students may enter a school and the requirement is that they're coming into a class and they're going to learn that material that they're being taught that day in the class, go home and apply it, analyze it, work with it, and then come back to class the next day and move on to a new set of content so the pace of that program is quick and the expectation is that the student can learn that material well in a quick amount of time, perhaps with uh, less directive instruction, that kind of a thing. So the rigor, the word rigor kind of means what is the experience like for your student in terms of what's required of them academically speaking, and the pace at which the program moves. So when you start to explore a program, I want you to think of your child in that program, and I want you to think of your family in that program. And will you be happy as the parent to support a child who needs to have a level of intensity around their study for the duration of their time at this school? Or will you prefer a school that has what we call a more well-rounded approach where a student may have more time to learn the material, may also have less demands on them in the academic sense. So the beauty of looking at the landscape of private schools is that you really have anything and everything at both ends of these spectrums and, and in between, right? And so what you'll want to do as you start your process and what we do here with our clients is we always work on just spending a little bit of time understanding your preferences as parents, as well as your child's learning preferences, if we know them. Sometimes for our very, very young children, we can guess a few things or we can see some patterns, but it may actually be more about what the parents are wanting and what they want to support. I still think for the middle school and high school students, having a bit of parent work is helpful. You as a parent want to know that if your child's in a very rigorous setting, you may need to offer a lifestyle to support that. Meaning you may need to shut your house down at the end of the day so that work can get done. You may need to not travel on the weekends and make sure your child has time on Saturdays and Sundays to get work done. There may need to be support if there needs to be support in a particular subject, such as tutoring and things of that kind. So you'll want to get all of this down before and also during your search and application process. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is sort of where the unexpected like, huh, I didn't think about that before comes in a lot of times for my clients. So in the landscape, this may be very obvious, but certainly something else you want to consider is whether you want a co-educational or single sex school. There are a 
variety of different types of coeducational and single sex schools in the city, but you may want to explore both as you're looking at schools, just so you can become intimately educated about them and their approaches. Oftentimes families will come in, we'll start our work together, and the families will say, we don't want to have a single sex school. That is not what we want. We want coeducational. That is what we want. And I'll say, that's fine. I want you just to go and look at one single sex school, just to go for an open house, just to read about why they do things the way they do things. And if after that, you really still feel that's not for you, it's fine, but I don't want you to have a regrets process. And I don't want you to also be uninformed about what's out there and what's possible. So it is something to consider. And sometimes a great place to start with is just, hmm, why is, why is this offered? What's the purpose of having a co-educational or a single sex school? And could this actually be something to explore for my child and my family, right? Um, oh, cursor issue. Okay, so in addition, we have in the landscape city schools and then we have campus schools. So there are a couple of schools that have, that are sort of on the outskirts of Manhattan. When I say city, I'm sort of referring to the Manhattan uh, more uh, you know building oriented schools that have uh, buildings within a city block and maybe those students will go outside for a play yard or to a play yard, but they may also walk or commute to a field for sports. Uh, they may go to the park for their outdoor time. They may have a swimming pool in their building, things like that. Um, if you're going to a campus school, you're going to see that most of the time you're going to have segregated areas for your younger kids, middle school kids and your high school kids. And there's going to be larger buildings and more space, of course. And in addition, there's usually a commute involved in, in some of these more campus like day schools, private schools. Um, so it may be important for you to look at both and just see which you prefer. If you have a high school student, you might want to have them really go online and take a look at some of these different facilities so that they can understand and try to place themselves within the school. This is the challenge of right now, which is that we can't go to the schools to see them, which is really hard. So with our middle and high school kids, we have to engage them in looking online and really talking them through what it may be like to be at these schools, because otherwise it feels very abstract for them. Um, it feels abstract for us because it is. <laughs> Um, in addition, you're going to have schools that have a progressive or a more traditional or classical uh, approach. And I would just say that many of my families come in and are very confused about these terms, which I understand because also while they do have a certain definition uh, or, you know, denotation, they, they also have a connotation that's used in a variety of ways with different schools. So progressive to one school might mean this, and then progressive to another school might mean this, and it becomes a little bit confusing. So what I would just say about this is that you want to go direct to the school and actually find out how they're using this word and how are they defining this word and how are they using it to create curriculum and things of that kind. And how is your student going to learn in that particular school? These are the questions you want to ask rather than me saying, well, progressive means this, because really it's going to be different per school in some ways. There's going to be nuances to it. Um, so I want you to look at both. I want you to see like, how does your child, how would your child learn in this environment? Will you as parents be comfortable with the way that the learning is set up? So some of my families will come in and say, I'm really uncomfortable with a environment that doesn't have tests, quizzes, the, the formalities that I feel are important to education. And we'll dig in there and we'll talk about a little bit about whether that's important to keep or if it's something that we want to look at in terms of their child's learning, will their child agree with them or will they not agree with them, right? So there's a little bit of that we can, we can dig into too. So in addition to all of the other areas or buckets that I was describing, each of the schools in the New York City landscape, of course, but actually we're actually studying many schools outside of New York as well. And it's very interesting because this is a time in which schools are really defining their diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, pieces. And they're also really evolving them. And we're having phone calls this March with each school that we work with just to learn more. And we'll have a whole webinar actually to present 
different trends and different ways that schools are having uh, curriculum changes and, and just all of the really interesting work that schools are doing right now that, that will impact students' choice on schools. So I think it's important that you as a family get your thoughts together first so that you can explore what it is that you connect with, what you want your child to be engaged with within the learning of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, what you want in terms of a curriculum. Do you, do you prefer your child to learn in a global sense? And how is then this particular school bringing that into the school? Or how perhaps is the American-centric curriculum being taught and what is that implication for my child, right? So really we're doing a deeper dive because this is such an evolving area for many schools and families have very different places of connection to all the things that are happening within schools right now. So we're seeing families leaving schools for certain reasons. We're seeing families gravitate towards schools for certain reasons. And so really our job is just to really hear from families and to present information from schools to the families so that we can help everyone to have information that will help them make decisions for their family and for their children. But this is definitely an area that I want you to think about and consider when you're looking at private schools. The other area, and this is sort of the last one in this, in this, uh, this section, is I want you to think about whether you want to have a school that you look at that's really a pre-K or a K to eight school versus a pre-K to 12 school. So families that look in New York City often will have really strong opinions about one versus the other. And what we do in our consultations is we teach about what the differences could be per school. So sometimes, generally speaking, a K to eight school will do uh, a, very, a very good job of forming a middle school experience, really, really dialing in on that age group and making sure that all the teachers who are teaching grades six through eight, let's say, are skilled and the best middle school teachers possible versus perhaps a K to 12 school may put more emphasis in their high school and then bring high school teachers down to their middle school. And so you'll wanna look at a little bit of that and see what's happening. In addition, if you have a K to 12 school, you may have curriculum that really builds on each other throughout the time that your child's at the school. So when you're coming in in pre-K or kindergarten, you will wanna study what's happening in high school because ultimately you wanna be okay with that trajectory of where your child may be going, right? Not to say that that's where your child will stay forever necessarily, but that that's likely what you're investing in to some degree. Many schools have started pre-K programs. So I just wanna take a minute to address that. If you notice that a school has a pre-K program, that's going to be a really good entry year. So I have families coming to see me as early as when their children is, you know, are two or one years old, just to start planning some of this out because it's more difficult to get into a school that has a pre-K in kindergarten, which most families are thinking about in terms of this, this process. Um, in addition, there are going to be different entry points for different schools. Some schools have a large number of sixth grade spots. Some schools have very few sixth grade spots. Some schools have uh, you know, a lot of ninth grade spots, but they're also looking for certain kids to have certain other activities or interests and things of that kind. So you'll definitely wanna be strategic in how you're planning the entry of your, um, of your process. So here we're gonna get into a couple of timeline pieces. So I just wanna talk a little bit about this. So again, where I want you to start today, as soon as you're off this call, or if you wanna pause this, if you're watching the recording, is write down some of the things that are really important to your family about education. So what is important? Do you wanna be close by? Do you wanna have a traditional set? Whatever you think you want, write it down. This can change at any time and it probably will change. It's a process. You have no decisions to make until you have offers in your lap. Then you have a decision to make. But for right now, all you need to do is just entertain this open process of exploration. So write down the things that are important to your family. Write down the things that are important to your child. Even at a very, very young age, your child can tell you certain things about their brains and about what they enjoy. And we can look at developmental checklists and highlight areas of strength. At a, at a for a child who's in middle school and high school, we, I interview them. I get a whole interview together and we actually ask a ton of questions which helps us to understand their perspectives. 
and their perspectives are very, very essential to this process. From there, we're going to construct a wish list. So this could be, uh, we have a form, but you know, it could be any, and I, and I talk about it in the book too, but we have a, a, a way to kind of give certain qualities based on what your family wants, your child wants, but also logistical stuff like co-ed, um, location, time, schedule, uh, whether the kids can have get homework done during the day, whether there's a huge homework load, whether there's a commute, you know, there's a particular sport, you name it, we write it all down. So then we know what we're looking at. And then we go and create the school list. So from there, you're going to go and this spring year, if you're watching this right now, it's now end of February, which is a perfect time to start your private school process. Yay for you for being here. Um, it's so helpful because you don't have to uh, rush things and you can use the spring as a time to plan and really investigate schools and attend open houses, which is really, really helpful. So this is how you're going to start. You're going to start visiting schools online. I'm really speaking about this process specifically for this spring during the pandemic. So these are the ways that you're going to learn about schools right now. Okay. You're going to go visit the schools online. You're going to go to their websites. You're going to take notes. And if you don't understand what they're saying, you're going to keep a list of those questions. And if you're a New York City Schools member, if you're in our membership, you can submit questions in there. And every Wednesday, I broadcast answers. Oftentimes, the questions have to do with, I was reading Horace Mann's page. What does this mean? Or I don't know which school I'm supposed to look at because here's my wish list. You tell me what I'm supposed to be looking at, right? So we can always do a consult and you can go through all your questions, but certainly go to the websites. These schools during the pandemic often have updated their websites to be much more informative than what they used to be. And, you know, parents ask often, do they actually do what they say they're doing on the website? And I would say it depends on the school for sure. And at the same time, they're going to give you some insight into some parts of their school. You'll want to go deeper than just the website. You'll also want to look at some databases. I think many families are looking at, you know, niche, great schools, private school review. All of those are great pieces of information. Just know where they're coming from is only really a couple of different perspectives. So again, you don't want to just use that or sort of eliminate a school because they're number 25 on that list, you'll definitely want to continue to do a deep dive beyond that, but it is good information to have. In addition, you'll want to go to open houses. So this is going to be important. And I'm just going to put a little bit of a tip in here where I want you to know that an open house on Zoom could be a very intimate experience. You could end up on a Zoom with a few people and the head of admissions at a school. You'll want to be prepared. You don't want to be uh, accidentally on your phone and your kids aren't ready and things are kind of crazy and you're you know not expecting to have questions prepared, uh, you definitely want to get prepared because these events tend to be a little bit more intimate than the way they used to be uh, before this. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these things a little bit quickly because I want to be able to get to a couple other things and we only have a few more minutes. Um, but I want you to know that then from there, you're going to, in the fall, this starts in August or so, you're going to start this process, which is really what I call the work process, where you're filling out applications, you're going on test prep. Uh, you know, most students are starting test prep now for the fall because the, the tests are going to be given in October, November, and December. So they're usually starting in February or March to prepare for tests. Um, interviews can be prepared for more in the fall, and there's a ton of writing to do for students as well as parents, and that's something that you'll want to be prepared for. Okay, so a couple of truths that I have for you. So this is about your kids. <laughs> um, I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but it's definitely about your kids. So you always want to bring it back there whenever you can, right? It's always about your children. If you're 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 amazing, we all know that, but we definitely want to make sure that this the emphasis and the discussions that you're having with schools are always about your kids. You want to look for that connection and the fit with the school, and that's always what you're going towards. And you want to always produce interest in schools, so that's why you go to events that schools offer. That's why you also will communicate your capability of affording the school. If you feel you need financial aid, you'll want to make sure you fill out those forms. 
Um, and you'll want to show commitment to this process. So it's not something to be taken lightly. This is a competitive process. And part of it is your investment in the process. All right. Some of it is, is in your control and some of it is not. So you're going to control what you can and the rest of it is going to be out of your control. And wonderful candidates get rejected. Wonderful candidates get waitlisted. It is sometimes not in your control. But what you can do is you can make sure that you're doing all you can do to put forth your best application and that you're prepared during the process, which you're already doing. So good job. Okay, a couple of key considerations. So these are just areas of research that we tend to do with schools. Um, and then again, just some advice uh, around the process. So please take time to explore schools in the spring. Typically events will start in April and go through May. Um, Please make sure if you have a middle school or high school child that you do prepare for the test starting now. We tend to uh, look into the SSAT and ISCE and figure out which test is actually stronger. If we're looking at boarding schools, we may decide to go towards the SSAT if, if a particular boarding school prefers it. Uh, most day schools will take either test, but it is an important component for many schools. Um, and this is really what your fall will look like. So here's a timeline. I'll pause here if you want to take a photo of this or just kind of grab at it. Again, it goes. We, I go into a deeper dive in, in the book on this too, but this is just a timeline for you uh, to know it's really a year process. So you start now and you'll work you know, through, you'll have a break in the summer for about two months and then come back in the fall. And now is when we have our notification dates. So a couple of tips, I also just kind of talked about this before, but you wanna make a wish list. You wanna be comfortable looking around and uh, inquiring and applying. And I'm gonna go through a couple of Q and A's in the time we have left. Um, if you would like to have some more support, I want you to know that we're here for you. This is our business and we're happy to support you. I also just wanna forward through some of the questions and just share with you that we are in open enrollment season for our New York City Schools membership program which is a wonderful program that we just started this fall. And it is uh, it contains modules from two's programs through high school in both the public and private system. We're educating families on the processes involved through videos and uh, worksheets and modules. And you as a member can also submit questions within that platform. And every Wednesday I broadcast specifically to members in the program to answer questions um, it's a wonderful program. It's lifetime membership. So if you have a young child, you will have it for the rest of your time. And we're only going to be adding to it and making it better. So you can uh, email Stephanie to get that link if you'd like to. Um, it's really, really fantastic. So just a couple of questions I'll go into. Um, so, you know, what if, what if I don't really want my child to go to a private school, but my you know, uh, my child wants to explore it. This sometimes happens for my middle school and high school families. And what I would say is, this is where you, the, the parents wanna write down what you want in the school, what you think is important, allow your child to do the same, and then kind of dig into why not, and let us talk about a little bit of those things. And maybe we can come to an understanding or some kind of compromise around the situation. But I really think it sometimes involves uh, um, further discussion. Um, what if I'm not part of a private preschool and wish to apply to a pr competitive private school? So this is certainly something we work with often. And I would just say it requires a larger set of schools to apply to often. And it also requires a lot more work on the family's part to advocate and to share information with ongoing schools. We do need to usually have a strong school report. So wherever your child is in school, we'll have to make sure that that's done as well as possible. So there are ways that we have to tend, you know, communicate to schools about your child, especially in the more competitive schools. But each school is a little bit different on how they receive information. How do you learn more about the schools when we can't see them in person? So this is really where, again, I teach a multiple perspective or multiple bucket uh, research approach anyway for schools. So I always want families to go to events, see, you know, see the building in, in non-COVID times, talk to parents who are in the school, talk to teachers, uh, ask questions. I want you to get all the information you can from different sources. 
Um, but also we can help. We can help paint the vibe. We, you know, many of my uh, staff members and I have been in the buildings of these schools. We can tell you a little bit about our experience supporting kids in the school and our tutoring practices. So, you know, we can give you some insight, but it is going to require more legwork on your end and more imagination. <laughs> and it's not easy. Believe me, I understand. Um, Oh, and that's it. Okay, so thank you so much for attending. Um, this will be on recording as well. And again, if you'd like to get your copy of the book, just email Stephanie after this. Thank you so much for attending this morning. I hope you found that helpful. If you ever have additional questions, we're always happy to answer them. That is what we do. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much.